Welcome to Plymouth 400 Conversations. I'm Michelle Pecoraro and I'm your host for this series. The 400th commemoration of our nation has inspired a body of work, poetry, film, literature, and art. This series will explore several of these projects and how they contribute to the historic, educational, and cultural legacies of the Plymouth 400 commemoration. In this episode, we will talk uh, about the unprecedented exhibit, Our Story, 400 Years of Wampanoag History. Our guests are Stephen Peters, a principal at the native-owned Smoke Signals in charge of marketing and creative development, and Robert Peters, an artist, writer, and poet. Both are members of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Stephen and Robert, welcome to Plymouth 400 Conversations. Thank you. It's good to Thank be you, here. Michelle. Good to see you both. So I'm going to jump right in. The exhibit, Our Story, which um, I have a uh, the first chapter uh, pictured here, captured 1640, um, 1614, sorry. Um, the, this was conceived and presented to Plymouth 400 by Paula Peters um, in 2014. The exhibit has been all around New England at libraries, museums, schools, and public spaces with a new section and topic added each year until 2020. Robert, your art is prominent in the segment called The Great Dying that addresses the plague that nearly wiped out Eastern tribes, including the Wampanoag. Can you both talk about the process of making the concepts of our story that Paula had envisioned resonate with a diverse audience? and? Um, Robert, why don't we start with you since um, you did the artwork for that specific piece? Um, well, uh, actually, it was a joint. Uh, it was me and my son. My son actually oh. drew the people. Um, and I drew the, uh, the fort and the lodges. And we had to do a lot of research, you know, on what people were wearing, uh, wh what the, um, the village would look like. Um, and, um, you know, even the flag uh, that would be on the ship, uh, I guess the flag was used to cover one of the bodies when, when the people first started getting sick. Um, so we want to be accurate about how we lived and how our, our villages were built and how our lodges were built. Um, and as an artist, you always want to do justice to... Uh, Putting, putting these pieces of our history together. Uh, and it was a good experience doing it and um, it, uh, people appreciated the outcome. Uh, and th then there was the creative aspect of putting the four, we did four different time periods with the, um, the, the pandemic when they first arrived, when they started getting sick and then when everybody died because it, to, to show how quickly that it happened. Um, and uh, people would get sick and die within hours uh, so that you couldn't even really uh, bury the dead. And it, it was something that was so lethal uh, and moved so quickly. Uh, it went from uh, Southern Maine to Plymouth and then it went inland and it was about a 15 mile um, stretch. So all of the people on the coast, um, which you know included Plymouth and it included the Boston area uh, and villages mm -hmm. on the Ponset uh, and all of our coastal villages uh, were wiped out and much of, you know, much of our history and things that we passed down died, died with them. Um, there was, not a lot of time to, you know, uh, say, hey, what do we, what do we, uh, what do we save, or what could we take with us? Right. Nobody got away. Uh, and, yeah, a lot like a, a natural disaster would have, you know, a hurricane or, you know, wiped out a lot of that knowledge. But this was uh, more, much more far-reaching and much more of a, I'd say, personal kind of illness. Um, much like what we're experiencing now, except we have ways of, of uh, avoiding, you know, being very hurt by it. Um, Stephen, 
so you actually had to come up, conceptualize all of the different chapters of our story. How was that? Um, and again, you know, Robert, you worked with your son, which that must have been uh, amazing to be able to do something like this with your son. And Stephen, you know, this was your mother's um, original thought process and concept. So how did you bring this stuff to light for people like me, for people who don't, you know, necessarily really know anything about um, Native culture, even though you're right here in, you know, uh, in uh, our part of the country. So just speak a little bit to that. Yeah, you know, when we, when we went into this, my mother had, had the idea that, that we wanted to create uh, an exhibit that explored this part of history from the perspective of Native Americans um, she knew it was something that really hadn't been done before. And so we wanted to make sure that, that we did it as accurately as, as we could. And so the way, the way that we did it was we first went in and we tried to understand the important events leading up to, to 1620 and give people an idea of why Patuxent became Plymouth, why the pilgrims were allowed to settle there, why there was um, interactions that occurred, uh, put things into perspective. And so the way that we did that is we took the, the primary source documents that the Europeans had left behind where they were very, very careful to document some of these important events. And they were very raw about um, the slavery that took place, uh, the fighting, um, the good and the bad. It's all laid right out there for us. What we did is we then filtered that through the perspective of our ancestors. We did that by tapping people within our community, uh, a lot of family, which was, you know, my uncles, my mother, um, but a lot of other tribal members, not just Mount Street Wampanoag as well, Aquina, Herring Pond. Um, we tried to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to review this history and let us know what it meant to them. And then it was our job to relay that in a way that the general public could, could understand it and could feel the emotion that was in it. That's what we tried to do. It really does humanize um, this history and, and the Wampanoag people. Um, so thank you for that, because that's something I think was missing. Well, a lot was missing in, in history, but especially that humanization, um, because, because Native people weren't really seen as the same level of human as, as um, the colonists. So. Um, our story has several chapters, Stephen, as this is to you. Um, each one is done differently with design and, and exhibit thought process. Is there one chapter of our story that stands out to you the most, Stephen? Um, and if so, why would that be? It, it's definitely the first chapter. Uh, so the captured 1614, that was when we really took a concept um, and, and put it out there for the public. And we were able to see how people reacted to it. And we had no idea when we went into this, we're like, you know, we didn't know how the General Society of Mayflower descendants were gonna react to it. Some of the, you know, historical institutions that had previously, you know, 50 years, 30 years prior to that really invested in a narrative that in our view was not accurate. Um, and we didn't know how they, they were gonna react to this. And the captured 1614 is not, a touchy-feely story. I mean, it, it's very, very raw. I mean, here you have these young men that were captured, taken slaves, sold as slaves, um, and one of them finds his, his way back. Um, that, that is a really challenging story, and we explore how that would have impacted the villages. So when we put that out there, we had no idea what the reaction was going to be, and we were completely shocked to find that everybody was coming forward, like, you know what, this makes sense, this is the history that, that we align with, They're, you know, and they did say, you know, maybe we would have put the pilgrims in a different light had we, had we done that, you know, but that's the native perspective. That's, that's what you get when you put it in our eyes and our voice and it gives balance to it, you know? So we were surprised at how well it was received. And at that point we knew then we're, we're on the right path. Let's keep this going and keep rolling out these chapters and stay true to the, the history, the way that we're reading it. Um, and we've created something great. Absolutely. And it is so moving. Um, every chapter has, you know, uh, has its, uh, its appeal to people, but, but that one is especially, I think, um, 
it really hits you in the face, but not in a, in a negative way at all. It just really lays out that history. So uh, I, I, I think that that's my favorite part of, of the exhibit as well. So, um, so we have Stephen Peters, we have Robert Peters, I've mentioned Paula Peters. How does delving into Wampanoag history together affect your family ties or does it affect them at all? Uh, Robert, why don't you take that one? Well, um, it, it, it's good to be able to work together, you know, uh, with, with uh, your siblings and your relatives. Um, and basically, my role in this uh, was d just to be supportive in the way that I could, I could su support it, you know, um, and uh, that was mainly artistically. Um, and you know, it, 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 was, it was good to be able to come up with something that, that you need, um, that's needed for the project to be complete. Um, and I have something called the hat system, you know, that, uh, where everybody wears a, wears a hat. Um, yeah. And I just wore my hat. Yeah, very good, very good. And Stephen, yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, my uncle's right on the, the point. I mean, you, you, you kind of put your hat on and, and you do what's needed. What made it easy was that, you know, my mother provided us with the framework. And, you know, whenever we stepped outside of that framework, she was there to, to sort of crack the whip and say, no, no, that's, that's not the direction that we're going. Or this isn't staying true to the history, the way it was, was laid out. Um, and it also makes it easy because we are, Sort of a matriarchal society so for me taking direction from my mother not only because she's my mother but because she is an elder she's more um, experienced in you know everything that she's done so for me taking that direction from her is just a natural um it's very natural for me you know and uh that that made it made it easy and uh, i i don't think it impacted our our family relationships at all i mean we've yeah you know yeah it's uh, very, it's a very good process. Yeah, it's, it is wonderful to see, um, you know, to see people working on their, um, their culture together. So um, thank you for like bringing that to, to, uh, to all of us. Um, Robert, from my perspective, I'm going to get off of, of the uh, exhibit a little bit right now. Um, I see so much that is not understood by the general population about the very people that are the original people of this land. In speaking to you, Robert, you had said, it is a constant struggle to maintain our culture in today's world. How is the duality of maintaining tribal culture while living in the 21st century uh, America expressed through your art? Well, I, um, I try and depict us either now or in the not so distant past. And, you know, sometimes maybe in the future. Um, and I, I do not like to dwell in, you know, um, the early history um, of what we went through. I really want to focus on what we're doing now and where we're, we're going now and who we are. Um, and as far as the duality, um, I, I vote. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a Massachusetts resident. Um, but as a Native person, I'm a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, uh, and I can vote among the tribe. But as a Native person, I don't have a voice in the United States government. We don't have congressmen or senators um, and it's very complicated uh, to 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 be an Indian you know uh, there are probably nine different legal classifications of Indians right um, federally recognized state recognized uh, and even with the pandemic you know we had to track down unrecognized Indians or undeclared right. Indians because you still have the genetics that made you su susceptible to mm -hmm. COVID. Right. And, um, so, so that's really the first real major uh, point where 
that was recognized and, and, and sought after, you know, okay, what about all these people that are, are state recognized or unrecognized tribes? You know, how do we get, you know, COVID vaccines to them? Right. And, you know, um, it, it, made, it made those different classifications count in mm -hmm. an official way. Um, and they're still working on, it. you know, we, you know, I, I go on other phone calls working on addiction and, you know, uh, with COVID, uh, the, the COVID vaccines came up and how we, how are we going to get them out and how we're going to reach, uh, the different people. Um, and, you know, to, to divide us up into so many ways makes it hard to interact amongst our own selves. Right. Um, there are blood quota tribes, you know, and that's one level of recognition. But if you are a child of a blood quota parent and you marry outside, you might not be eligible to be in that tribe. Really? Um, I, I, I always shake my head when I think about that. <laughs> I was like, OK, um, but right. but what about those people? You know, they're still Native people. They still have rights, you know, um, and um, maybe there's an error in the way that they've identified themselves that they need to correct. And, and there's a lot of things that, you know, we could do better. And um, I think, you know, in identifying these things and to look at our status in, in, in the country, um, we just got our first secretary of interior, um, which, you know, is what we're under. No other Americans are under that. You right. Know? Um, and it used to be the Department of War. Wow. Um, so, and their prime directive, if you go into like Star Trek, you know, their prime directive was to discourage communication between Native people. Right. Right. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. Um, very detailed and meaningful. Um, I'm going to continue with you, Stephen, along the lines of that last question. Uh, you attended college, you worked in the business world, you have a lovely family. Um, now you're a principal in Smoke Signals, uh, the Wampanoag owned communications company. You really live with one foot in each of two cultures, uh, especially with your work. Um, and one is based on a European patriarchal system. And you've mentioned uh, earlier about the Native Matriarchal Society. Can you share with us your thoughts on family and modern Native society and how a matriarchal structure perhaps influences your life today? Uh, you know, my, um, you know, we're, we're all influenced by the way that, that we're brought up. And, you know, I was lucky to be brought up by uh, a very, very strong and creative family. Uh, you know, and, and I think I take take pieces of all of that that with me. You know, my my uncles, uh, both Robert and my uncle Ross, are super super talented artists. Um, you know, in, in not just in their artwork that they create, but in music and and just everything that that they do. Um, and then I was brought up by these strong women as well. My mother and my grandmother. Um, you know, they've they've influenced every aspect of. The way that that I live my life today. Um, the process of getting here, though, was was really challenging because you do you kind of have a foot in each each side. Um, you know, coming up through college, you're you're constantly trying to to figure out where where your place is, and then even after that, when you start your career, um, there are very very challenging points. You know, for me, um, as I was becoming more successful in the corporate world, um, I found it extremely challenging to um, to, to necessarily, to do what was needed by, by my employers, um, which some points I had one time where there was an older woman that reported directly to me. Um, I had such a hard time giving her critical feedback, um, or giving her specific directions and telling her what to do. Um, for me, it was just, it was an odd dynamic and, and I couldn't find a way around that. It took a while for me to put my finger on exactly why I was so uncomfortable with that situation. Um, once I had, I realized I needed to get out of the corporate structure. It, it was not something that aligned with um, my upbringing. And so at that point I knew I got to do this on my own, um, you know, and, and, and make a corporate structure 
that aligns with my culture and traditions. And that's what we've done. Um, and now I am far more comfortable with everything in my life, including my family um, and the balance that I have with it. So uh, I just had to find my own way that, that fit within those two worlds. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing and a, a hard thing to do. And uh, yeah, you seem to have done it well and with grace. So that's wonderful, Stephen. Um, we, have a, we have several minutes left. Um, I, this next question, you know, is re, re, refers to the trauma over centuries. So we've only begun to recognize the effects of historic trauma and, and what it's like to be exiled from your own culture right on your own homeland. Robert, as a visual artist and poet, please describe how your Wampanoag culture with all its generational trauma has inspired and influenced your pictures and words in reshaping stereotypes and bringing the native story of the past into the focus of 2021. And it doesn't have to be the distant past, even the more recent past. Well, um, I think uh, growing up in a, in, in, a, in a town where in my lifetime, we lost c political control. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we anticipated it. We anticipated that one, one day we wouldn't be able to elect our town officers. Uh, one day we wouldn't be in control of the government there. Um, and it was a tremendous loss to our people. Um, and uh, I, I think that traumatized us probably more than anything else to all of a sudden be under somebody else's control that didn't understand you. Um, and when we, we petitioned for our land back, um, they, um, they boycotted our businesses. Um, so with that, most of our businesses went under. So there was economic uh, rigor mortis that, that took mm -hmm. place. Um, and I have to say now in the last 10 years, we're, we're more traumatized than I've ever seen. Our, our people um, and with the drugs, we're you losing somebody every month practically uh, yeah. out of out of 3,000 3, or so people. Right. Um, and one of the things I'm doing is working with the Department of Substance Abuse and doing some artwork for uh, preventative uh, drug booklets and, and, and a cur curriculum. And we had to push for that curriculum. So it was more than just the artwork. It was it was the teachings that go along with the artwork, um, and in one of them, I have a, all these people in a circle, and somebody in the circle, you know, introducing something bad, um, and the power of the circle and a way of teaching people is everybody realizes when you get in a circle and hold hands, um, there's power in that, um, but if you allow something bad into your circle like drugs or alcohol or even mean-spiritedness those things gain the power of the circle and I'm really proud of that lesson because it's a lesson that's presented in a way that our young people understand you know you could mm -hmm. say that a, a thousand different ways you know and it could bounce right off of them but you know to to teach it in, in a way that they have, they have control. They have the, the power to say, don't do this in my circle or the power to actually leave that circle. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are important choices that, that people make. So my artwork um, and my writing helps uh, influence that, you know, in today's society. Um, so yeah, I, I do try to keep you know, one, at least one foot in what's happening right now yeah. uh, to, to express uh, the things that, you know, uh, need to be shown or taught to people. Thank you, Robert. Uh, you know, um, I think people listening to this um, are going to have a whole different perspective um, on, on what you all live through. Uh, so I appreciate you being very upfront uh, with all of this. Um, finally, 
Uh, we have about two minutes left. I'd like to ask Robert to share an excerpt from one of your poems with us that exemplifies some of the ancient and modern ties that we've discussed here today. And I know the, the, the painting behind you is one you did called Exile. I, um, and I know there's some, some, uh, some poetry that goes along with that, but you can choose anything you'd like. Well, I think Exile is good. Um, yeah. And it's the first uh, painting I did when I kind of came out of an exile. I, I retired from working on the uh, Transit Authority. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, poetry, the poem that went with it. I was a spiritual exile. The trees sent me away. They instructed me to live in the white man's world and not return until I achieved the kind of success that white men aspire to have. I had a white man job, ate white man food, and walked in the white man's shoes. Essentially, I was a white man, not irreversibly or forever, but for a time. I was exiled from the forest, exiled from the waters, exiled from the sacred circle, and only returned to these places during brief interludes measured in white man's time. I argued with the great spirit about this. I argued for years on end, in and out of many seasons through the cycles of uncounted moons, but the great spirit remained silent and kept his silence, no matter how much I ranted and raved until one day I stopped fighting and my restless spirit became quiet and still. Then subtly, almost unperceivable, like a whisper, he began to show me things. He gave me insight, the ability to decipher my own experiences, to look, to see, to listen. That's, uh, that is beautiful and amazing. And it really tells the story um, of, of many native people in today's world. So thank you for that, Robert and Stephen. Um, thank you also. I, you know, we could do this for another half hour. <laughs> I have many more questions. So maybe we'll come back to you in another episode, but Stephen and Robert, it has been an honor and a pleasure to interview you today. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us for Plymouth 400 Conversations. Special thanks to our sponsors and guests who have made this series possible. Special thanks to our partners at PAC TV and the Center for Active Living in Plymouth. For more information about this information and how to view past episodes, please view our website Plymouth400inc.org. Until next time, go make some history. <laughs>